make the best decision you can with the information you have, right? That's what allowed folks to, to be successful in the cockpit. We take a kid from, you know, let's say Kansas, who's never been in the military, never been in the Navy, never been on a ship, never worked on an airplane, and five months later, they're qualified to change a hydraulic actuator. Well, if you've learned anything from the roughly 200 episodes of this show, I hope it's that military aviators and fighter pilots in particular are not careless risk takers as Hollywood portrays, but rather careful calculating professionals who employ processes and checklists to ensure safe, effective operations. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. And joining me today in the Circle Air Group Studios here at Gillespie Field in San Diego, California, are Keith Kimmel and Yarko Sauce. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Jello, for having us. You're welcome. Oh, I'm looking forward to talking about some of these processes, right? I mean, we've got what? The way we come up with tactics, some briefing, debriefing. What are a couple we're going to maybe hopefully flesh out today? Sure. Uh, briefing, debriefing, uh process improvement, mm -hmm. and then how some of the things that we do translate outside of aviation. Yeah. Well, and that's the point, right, Combat? Because this isn't arguably the sexiest thing. We're not talking about a weapon or a shoot down or something, but these are vital to what we do. Yeah, clearly. I think if you're, if you're going to perform well in combat, it should be boring. Right. If you properly brief, execute, and debrief a flight, it it should be very boring. It shouldn't be exciting. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's a good way to look at it. Wouldn't make for a great movie, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, but that's the reality we seek. So yeah, absolutely. Correct. So Yarko Sauce, JJ, let's start with you. Before we get into all that, where are you from? What got you interested in the military? Where'd you go to school? And what'd you do? And where are you now? Sure, sure. So I grew up in Washington D.C. area. My dad worked for NASA, so the, during the height of the Apollo program, so that got me interested in aviation. Uh, Navy ROTC, Vanderbilt University, went right to flight training, flew Tomcats for 13 years in the Navy, right. finished up last two years at Top Gun, as, uh, where we crossed paths for probably the third or fourth time <laughs> in the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, then got out, uh, got hired by the New Jersey Air National Guard, flew Vipers for the Air Force for seven years. Oh, wow. So I ended up with 22 years in fighters, 4,000 plus hours. Oh, fantastic. VF-102 in CAG-1. Right? Yes. For CAG-1 when flying with VF-102. Okay. So did we do a deployment together or did you get out of there before I got there? Because I showed up to VF-86 in the air wing and my first deployment was GW in 97. Yeah. So I was uh, CAG paddles from 94 to 96. So we think just had a little overlap there. Yeah. And then you went to Top Gun and I think we're leaving when I got there. You're always running away from uh, me. I know. I, well, you know, I got to leave before the good guys show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Keith, uh, same question to you. Where are you from? What'd you yeah. do? And what are you doing now? So I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, my father was in the Naval Reserves. I can remember as a kid at a very young age going to Virginia Beach when he'd do his, his little summer two-week things and watching the F-4s light the burners as soon as they got feet wet. And I just thought that would be something fun to do. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 91. Uh, I was fortunate enough to fly in A6s and then F-14s and then uh, end, end my flying career as the skipper of the Jolly Rogers and, and Super Hornets. Fantastic. Um, then retired, I guess, eight years ago now. Okay. And you were an NFO, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was a bombardier navigator, Rio, oh, yeah. and then uh, weapon systems operator. Oh, wow. So. Yeah, you had all yeah, three so, titles. Yeah, I was able to kill a couple communities in there, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everywhere yeah. you went, uh, yeah, slowly, sundown slowly after that. Yeah, right. yeah. Good news. He's here. We're going away. Uh, yeah, right. there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, one thing I don't think either of you mentioned uh, is what are you doing now? So uh, as I finished up the military, I helped start a company called Check Six. Check Six, we teach and apply best practices from high hazard, high reliability industries, military a aviation, commercial aviation, uh, nuclear power, all of those things that worked for us in the military how do those things translate to other organizations that face the same challenges and don't have those years and years of experience that the military does? Yeah, well, or in aviation, right? So yeah. aviation in general is embedded with these processes, checklists, right? Right. Uh, and I think if I remember correctly, that was partly due to one of the early B-17s that took off with a gust lock on, killed everybody. And someone just said, well, gosh, if we just had this thing where we could cross off when we're doing whatever it is, removing the chocks, starting the engine, you know, unlocking the gust lock, 
then we wouldn't have uh, this tragedy. So checklists are big in aviation, apparently not as big in the rest of the world, but right. depending on the consequentiality, if that's a real word, of whatever it is they're doing, it might be useful. You're also over at CheckSec? Sure. Yeah, yeah so uh, when I retired from the Navy, I was fortunate enough to, to go to work for Deutsche Bank on Wall Street as an operational risk manager. Oh, wow. I did that for um, three or four years, and then I got promoted and moved to London, and then COVID hit. So that was interesting. But uh, Brew and JJ brought me over to Check Six to to help build out the technology and their operational risk programs over there. So I'm really excited to be there. Right. And, and I think to your point about checklists, I mean now you know they build airplanes around digital checklists, right? So yeah. it's it's pretty cool how far it's come since yeah. the B seventeen days. Yeah, good. Well, I'll be interested to hear a little bit from you. I've I've heard of Check Six. Now we've had Red Six on the show. Right. Uh, our buddy Guido is making a Check Six vodka. <laughs> it's an expression that I think most aviators are familiar with. But certainly, you know, sprinkle some of that in as we talk because I think it'd be interesting hopefully for the viewers and listeners to know if that's something that maybe they can apply their own lives and their own industries. Uh, but we'll take the point of view of how we all experienced it in our careers. And there's a couple different things we talked about, right? So tactics development, uh, there's briefing, there's debriefing, there's checklists, and we might flesh out a few more. But Yurka, let's start with like process development, which for us would be like tactics development. You and I were both at Top Gun, which is really one of their charters. Sure. And, you know, not only is Top Gun Right, it's the clearinghouse. It's the central location where where the all the experts sit that know the best way to do something. Mm -hmm. Whether it's dropping a bomb, whether it's the dogfight, there's somebody on the Top Gun staff that is considered the the subject matter expert on a particular thing. Right. right? And their role is not just to to teach that, but to constantly challenge the current status quo and and improve what we are doing. And you improve it for a number of reasons, right? Lessons learned from combat being the first one. Second one, as technology improves, can we find a better way to do what we're trying to do? Like people thought, okay, the class is over. I'm going to have some time off. And as you know, on the staff, the time between classes <laughs> was busier than the time during class because yeah. we were always working on trying to be better at whatever we were doing. Yeah, and more effective at it, right? Because uh, I believe, and you can maybe talk to this better than I can, but our mutual friend Stroker was looking at something we were doing to uh, survive being shot at by surface air missiles. And he said, hey, wait, maybe there's a better way. So not just something that needs to be uh, created, but maybe something we're already doing that could be done better. Yeah, the classic case was, you know, this was in the late 90s. Um, George Wyckoff is now going to be promoted to three-star admiral, assuming, you know, things things <laughs> happen in Congress and the Senate. But Stroker, you know, he sat there and goes, why are we doing the same surface-to-air missile defense in fighters that was done during the Vietnam War, right? And it was a maneuver called the GLIB or the SCAT, and it required you to maneuver the aircraft 45 degrees nose up, 45 degrees nose down, 40 this. degrees yeah. nose up. It took, it, um, and it did two things. Number one, it drained a lot of energy off the airplane. And mm. energy, i.e. speed is life. I'm sure people have said that a thousand times, right? You're <laughs> draining energy, and more importantly, you're moving your radar and your eyeballs away from where the bad things are coming at you, right? Generally, you're six o'clock. But, you know, so Stroker, as the subject matter expert on threat surface-to-air missiles, knew how they worked. He mm. knew how those systems worked. And he goes, hey, is there a different way that we can reduce the effectiveness of these missiles, right? And to reduce the effectiveness of them, you had to maneuver the airplane in order for the missile that's coming at you to drain energy, right? And instead so you, of you draining instead energy. Instead of you the, draining energy, you exactly. Yeah. You make the missile drain energy. And that's what Stroker figured out he came up with a new tactic called the SAM weave. It bled a lot less energy for the fighter. Your situational awareness remained high, and it caused the same challenges for the missile. Yeah. And we spent months flying on a training range where the threat emitters were to prove that he was right. Because at first, nobody wanted to believe him, right? <laughs> nobody wanted to believe him that this was going to work. Then the Air Force came out after the Navy said, hey, we think this works. You guys check it out. And they came out and tested it out. And... In the course of about three to five years, and I, by then I was in the Jersey Guard, but I remember, you know, our weapons uh, officer at the Guard coming to me going, does this really work? And I go, yeah, it really works. I was there when we tested it. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, it, it did. And, and that evolved across the Navy and the Air Force as the current, or it was, you know, back when I was still flying, mm -hmm. the current best way to defend against surface-to-air missiles. Yeah. And just in case people are having a hard time imagining this, I think if I remember correctly, a Sam Weave is maybe like a, um, a snowboarder going down a, a, half, a half pipe, pipe. and yeah. just going up and down both sides kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And to your point, the glib, another 
drawback of it, as I recall, uh, having tried it a few times when I was a young pilot, is when you get done, you're just disoriented. Yeah. Yeah. You're, <laughs> just... you're right side up, you're upside down, you're pulling G's. Yeah. And if you start at 25,000 feet, you finish at eight or 10,000 feet, which now drives you down into the heart of the threat. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. was the other key thing to avoid yeah. is you wanted to stay as high as you could because the, you know, surface air missiles go fast, have little wings. Thinner air up high, they can't turn as hard. Yeah. What you're really trying to do is have a non-lethal miss. Have yeah. the weapon detonate, the SAM detonate in a non-lethal position around your yeah. aircraft. Yeah, that makes sense. But I guess the point is, right, these processes, or in our cases, tactics, can be done at Top Gun. But I don't know, Combat, I mean, did you see this anywhere else? I mean, you you could do this in any organization, oh, I would yeah. argue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we so we have a, a digital checklist product um, called Rigger that we have in, in companies where, so especially out in oil rigs where you're doing really dangerous things mm -hmm. in high reliability organizations, you know, where if you, if you do them out of order, you can have catastrophic effects. Right, so we're able to digitize these processes, and in these industries, they're able to actually follow the checklist, so they're able to do it safely and efficiently. Yeah, but do people in those positions have maybe the same latitude as Stroker did to say, hold on a second, maybe we have new information or something else, and now we can come up with that? Because following a checklist is one thing, but coming up with the checklist is right. almost a different animal. You know, so it's, it's interesting in a lot of these organizations, you know, we said NATOPs are written in blood, right? A lot of the processes that they do in, you know, in the oil field and other industries is, is the same, right? Yeah. So they're definitely don't do's, yeah. but they're constantly trying to improve that process, those processes, not just from a safety standpoint, but also from a time and an efficiency standpoint, yeah. you know, and, and not to get into an AI conversation, but some of the stuff we're looking at with machine learning that we're going to be able to do where you can see patterns that you don't necessarily see, which I think is a lot of the stuff that you saw at Top Gun with Stroker's Missile D. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it's got a better name than that, but give George his due, <laughs> you know, where you're actually able to look at the analytics on the back end and really understand that, yeah. you know, I think another interesting example, and maybe not to change topics too soon, but if you look at what Freejack and what those guys were able to do at Top Gun with the radar game plans in the F-14, um, when I was a young Rio, you sort of did whatever you wanted to do with the radar, right? And F-18 guys would savage us for it, right? Because it was completely <laughs> manual and it was a guy in the back. Maybe he could make the radar work. Maybe he could and maybe he was, you know, mm -hmm. you just tried to sort of try to figure it out and you weren't really sure what you'd do and you'd sort of get advice from, depending on what squadron you were in, you got really good advice or really bad advice, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I think what Freejack did with the radar game plans for the F-14. I mean, it revolutionized air to air in the F-14 yeah. Yeah, against a Gen 4 threat. I think that's what it was back in the day. I'm dating myself now. It's been 20 years, right? Yeah, that would be like a MiG-29, SC-27, yeah. that kind of thing. So yeah. we, you were able to standardize how F-14s employed, especially, you know, with, with the guy in the back working the radar yeah. and the creativity that they had in using hot range wall search. And there were discussions from what I understand on staff going, you know, I'll never use that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, I guess, it gets back to the point you made, Jarko, is Top Gun, and we've had a lot of discussions in the studio about Top Gun, but that's sort of their charter, right? Is is you put together some smart people, get them even smarter by going off on these industry uh, visits or studying or whatever they need to do to become the SMEs, as you said, right, the subject matter experts. And then you come up with, hey, either this is a process that I have a theory that maybe we could do better, or we just don't have any standardization through the fleet. So what would be the most effective? And so I would argue that is the right place to do that. But I feel like somebody in the fleet could also maybe have come up with that if they were ambitious enough or smart enough to do it. And then in the case of the Navy, well, they do, they'll, they'll either write an article for one of our classified journals, or they'll send it in the top gun and say, Hey guys, I propose this mm -hmm. and they can take a look at that, but it can come from almost anywhere, but hopefully smart people end up looking at it and testing it. And, you know, that whole plan brief, execute debrief culture and, and continuous improvement, right? Mm -hmm. That's the debrief part of it is the hard part to get right. Yeah. You know, to really be critical in a positive way yeah. of how your execution was. Military aviation culture, the debrief is is ubiquitous and accepted and, you know, and, and ultimately where we learn um, in other organizations and in other industries, the debrief is can be more of a problem because, what, you're criticizing my work, you know, and they typically only debrief when they hurt somebody or break something, right. and that's now an investigation. It's not yeah. a true debrief in the sense of how, how you and I and, and combat grew up in the service. That's the challenge for organizations is, is, is can we build a culture where we can critically look at what we're doing without hurting somebody's feelings? Yeah. And, and I want to get to debriefs because, in my opinion, while I think a brief is what's going to set you up for success, I think a debrief is where you get the most learning. 
Absolutely. Because now you've already said, this is what we set out to do, and this is what happened, and now what can we learn from it? And I think a lot of people end up with their guard up or feelings are raw or whatever. Uh, we'll get to that. But first, let's go back. So, Combat, you were talking about checklists a moment ago. Mm-hmm. We all know they, these, obviously, as well as anything, but maybe there's someone watching or listening who doesn't really know that much about aviation. Just give us a quick primer of checklists. I mean, what is a checklist? I think I'll, I'll use a two-seat sort of example. Okay. Right? So a, a checklist is basically the steps that you need to take in the order that you need to take them to mm. most successfully and efficiently accomplish the tasks that you're trying to accomplish. Right. If you walk out to an F-14... The pilot's going to sit in front. The Rio's going to sit in the back. The pilot's going to go through his startup checklist. There's a couple items in there that the pilot has to let the, and they're typically safety of flight things, that the pilot's going to let the, the Rio know that he actually completed those. After the pilot starts the engines using a checklist, right? So it starts out when you're in flight school, and you can probably talk to this better than I can, Jello, where, you know, you literally have the book out and you're going, okay, you know, left throttle to idle, whatever the, it whatever was the sequence is. painful in 234. Yeah, 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 yeah it takes forever, right? So, <laughs> which, which um, lever? And then eventually you get to the point where things that aren't what I would say life critical, you do and you memorize, right? But then there's certain checklists that are always, you always have a challenge to reply, at least in an F-14 mm-hmm. scenario. And I assume that you have some sort of mechanism where you talk yourself through a takeoff checklist to make sure the airplane's properly configured to take off, the airplane's properly configured to land. I think the other place where you typically have a challenge and reply is in any sort of emergency situation yeah. where you need to make sure that you do the right thing and you're not turning one – you know, if you have a left fire light, you're shutting down the left throttle and not the right throttle, not taking one emergency and turning it into two, mm-hmm. uh, right, which is very important, you know, so it's kind of sitting on your hands a little bit. And then anything involving ordnance, obviously, um, and especially when you're working with friendly troops on the ground to make sure that, that everybody's on the same page. Um, before you deliver weapons. Now, I really like what you said about the things you do and the order you do them in, right? Because Mm -hmm. in some cases, it doesn't matter if you do a check if it's in the wrong order because maybe it's not energized or it doesn't have the hydraulic power or whatever. I like what you also said about the take one emergency, turn it into two. I had a different version of that. I used to say, take a malfunction and turn it into an emergency. Right, (laughs) that's that's a great example too. Yeah, Yeah. if you don't handle it right, you really could. Yeah, I flew a lot of single seat. Mm -hmm. um, and, And even for me, I had checklists just because there were certain things that were so critical, you can't afford to miss them. And, and I found that what I did, and I don't know if this was necessarily sanctioned or not, but I'll confess it publicly, is when I got in the F-18, instead of, I mean, I ended up with over 3,000 hours in it, but instead of, you know, APU switch off, okay, yep, it's off, you know, this switch, what I would do is I would look from left to right, just because I'm American and that's, you know, generally the direction we do things. And I just, after a while, just kind of knew everything where it should be. You know, like, okay, mm-hmm. that's not in the right place. Okay. And then, okay, then I'd like to look at the checklist and I just make sure like, does anything jump out at me? Maybe it's not the best way to do it, but that's how I did. Mm-hmm. But then there were certain things that I absolutely followed every time. Right. And it was because it was just critical enough that I knew not to say I could get away with it, but I knew the process well enough. And I think that's probably one of the challenges maybe you guys can talk to me about having worked with different companies is checklists are great, but you have to follow them, right? And in my case, like I said, I won't say I got away with it, but it usually worked. But all it takes is one time to not work because I overlooked something. Right. You can't just hand out checklists and say, start using them, right? You have to have a culture. And more importantly, uh, what's hard for organizations to understand is kind of the way the military has it. You get the big book, right? You got the big, all the big manuals. Then you've got the pocket checklist, the little book right. that you fly with in your G suit pocket. Mm-hmm. And then you got your checklist, the memory items that you had to know right. that if this if this happens, you need to do these three things from memory before you even go to the pocket checklist, yeah. right? Yeah. There are organizations out there that say, hey, all right, we're going to start using checklists, but they don't, A, they don't have a big book that you can translate to the little book that that then you can build a checklist on. And B, again, if, if people don't use checklists routinely during routine operations, then why would somebody pull one out in an emergency, uh-huh. right? That culture isn't there. Yeah. What you're going to rely on is the experience and the training of the person in the seat. You know, instead of I know my people are doing the right thing, mm. I, you're hoping your people do the right thing. Yeah. And you can have wildly different outcomes, you know, based on how well-trained. You know, I have, I have an experience-based culture, I have a process-based culture. And again, yeah. a lot of industries have made a lot of money over a long time on an experience-based culture, yeah. you know? And so I think that's where the challenge comes when you look outside of aviation is how are we training our people? And then, you know, 
we can't just expect them to start doing something if the culture in the organization isn't yeah. there. Well, right, the culture for military aviation, that's imbued in applicants from an early age. I mean, obviously, the community itself has the reputation of following checklists and crew coordination and various things. But also, once you start in the earliest simulators, it's just part of what you do. Yeah. I have to think some companies aren't like that. And if you aren't starting from that, to get to that, it's got to be a pretty big challenge, I would think. Yeah, because it is, like you said, it's a culture. I mean, I can remember sitting on a chair in my room in flight school with the PCL out. like Pocket checklist. Pocket checklist, yeah. like going through just like the startup mm -hmm. procedures, right? And literally going like that and trying to pretend. Chair flying. Like I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's like day one. But when you when you talk about a lot of these companies around workforce development, they're like JJ says, they are experience-based, right? Yeah. Guys, I've been doing this for 30 years. There's nothing you can tell me that's going to make me do this any better. Well, that sounds right? like my example for me, right? I just look around yeah. the thing. And so if you were to come to me, arguably, and say, Jello, you have to start doing item by item, I imagine you see this in industry a little bit, and I probably would have done it to you too, is, no, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. I was in the Navy when we transitioned to CRM, right? Crew and resource it was management. Crew resource management, yeah. which is now, you know, and I also, you know, fly for United on the side, and I know you, you know, have some airline experience as well, right? Mm -hmm. And the CRM and the checklist procedural discipline in the airlines blows the the military away, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. but other industries are now talking CRM, adopting CRM, looking at those, those seven critical skills, you know, in their training and in execution, there's two ways things can go. We can either blame and punish, i.e. blame and punish the worker, or we can learn and improve, <laughs> right? But you can't do both. Yeah. You can't say Jello screwed up today and he broke that piece of equipment and he's fired, you know, and versus the CRM and or the, you know, human performance awareness is why, did, why was the human allowed to make that mistake that, that broke that piece of equipment and cost my company a lot of money, Yeah. right? And we were so good at that and it was inculcated in the military to always learn and improve, learn and improve, learn and improve, you know, whereas in, in a lot of organizations, they're just making that transition now. Yeah. Well, the statement was made earlier that the NATOPS is, you know, written in blood, of course, figuratively sp speaking. But the point is, someone somewhere had a situation like your example just now of me screwing something up and breaking the equipment and getting fired. Maybe that person, arguably something bad happened, whether fired or killed or whatever. But now the rest of us, I guess, sort of unfortunately, but fortunately, can benefit from that because it finds its way into our processes. Mm -hmm. And now we are able to say, okay, we know that we need to stay clear of this or not do this or definitely do that. Right. And so checklists are just one more way. So do you find, do checklists generally always grow? I mean, it sounds to me like there would be not inflation, I don't know what else to call it, but always something that's added. And doesn't that get a little onerous after a while? I mean, you, these things have to be manageable, I feel like. I think that, that generally, probably that they do as you learn more, mm -hmm. but then as you feed back what you learn from those processes into the future de design of whatever system you're using, then the engineers from a product lifecycle standpoint, oh, wow. then look at the adjustment. Because I think this happens in the Hornet to the Super Hornet. I wasn't a test guy, so I can't give you specific examples, right? But but you learn from the first generation of the airplane, and then you, you take the process that you look at and you go, okay, how can we make these processes better? How can we make it easier on the pilot? And, you know, if you look at what a, what you could do in a C and look at what you could do in an E, I'm willing to bet you could accomplish a lot more in an E, yeah. right? Because you take all the lessons learned from all those process changes over the course of the of the airframe's life cycle. And what, what you can have a single seat guy or gal doing an Echo or an, an JSF, I'm sure it blows the doors off anything yeah. that you could do yeah. in an A or a C, right? Well, like you said, it's a, it's a feedback loop. So yeah. not just the checklist themselves, but the equipment. Right. It's better over time and maybe yeah. arguably a little more fail-proof or, or at least uh, harder to have a failure kind of thing. And, and I think, too, if, if you have a digital checklist now and you look at it doesn't have to be a stroker or a free jack that have a good idea that, hey, I think this might work. Now when you have digital checklists and analytics and you can start to put some machine learning to that, too – you know, the analytics start to paint the picture for you, right? Yeah. And they start to tell you, okay, well, step three is really, really hard. Except for JJ, because JJ manages to do the whole thing in 10 seconds, which means JJ is just going like this and he's not really doing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. for everybody else, step three is really hard. So from an engineering standpoint, from a process standpoint, how can we change step three to make that easier? Or is that something that we just want to automate because it's a human right. limitation? So it's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. But also with digital, unlike paper, 
Now we can incorporate different methods to make sure compliance in a sense, mm -hmm. where it can either turn green or it can go away or right. it can highlight to you if you haven't done it yet or if you do it out of order. So there's there's ways that as long as you know people that are operating equipment mm -hmm. are involved in something that we can make it more and more fail proof in a sense. Yeah. If yeah. What we can do with digital checklists is get the information from manual processes that historically we've only been able to get from automation. Yeah. Very cool. Oh. All right. So checklists can be for normal procedures. It can be for emergency procedures. We talked about ordinance. It can be part of a crew coordination with another person. So a lot of different checklists. And certainly we could probably explore that further. But let's move on to briefing. So, JJ, if you and I, or all three of us, really, right, if you two are in a Tomcat and I'm in a Hornet and we're going to go do a 1v1, let's say, right, we're not just going to get in our aircraft and go. We're going to talk about it in advance. So talk a little bit about briefing. Maybe, I don't know as much as the background that we need to talk about, but I guess the big thing is what's important about briefing? The most important thing about briefing is alignment, right? That everybody has a clear picture of what we're going to do, right? And, you know, whether you're going 600 miles an hour over the battlefield or whether you're sitting in a room like we are here, you know, getting ready to go to work, we want to kind of have the same structure and the same flow to our briefings in order to be sure we are aligned in order for everybody to receive information in yeah. kind of a, a sequence that they're expecting to see it, you know? And so, you know, what's, what's our objective? What are we trying to do? What resources do we have to accomplish that objective? Hey, I have four F-18s with six Mark 83s, or I have two A-10s with you know, five Mavericks, right? Mm -hmm. What And the gun, right? What resources do I have? So objective resources, how are we going to do the job, the test steps, and then we're going to risk assess, mm -hmm. right? And then the last thing we're going to talk about when we're going to debrief, right? But those five steps, objective, resources, test steps, risk assess, debrief, you know, we did that 600 miles an hour because that's all you could do. That's about all you could figure out in order to process that information. And again, that works in, in, any organization, yeah. you know, that's my take on briefing is everybody's aligned. Everybody ex receives information in a consistent format mm -hmm. and everybody has, has no question when they're walking out the door to go yeah. to work, what they're going to do. And some of that consistent format is the culture of your organization, right? From VF-102 to VFA-86, we might have had a slightly different way of briefing, but it was all pretty much naval aviation standard. So you would, when you showed up, you knew that we'd probably start with what's the weather today. Right? Right. Because if you've been, for whatever reason, indoors all day, particularly on a ship, right. you might not know that it's either really nice outside or it's storming. Right. And if right. it's storming, we need to get above the weather. But yeah, when you said whether we're flying or the three of us sitting here, it occurred to me, right i picked you all up at the air at the hotel we briefed on the way in now right. it wasn't standardized but i told you roughly what to expect mm -hmm. and we had some contingencies in a sense and that's i think one of the other things is i like the word alignment but we also talk about contingencies right because here's what we think we're going to do right mm -hmm. we're going to go out there and you know in the case of today hey guys we're going to go and we're going to sit at the table you'll be on that side i'll be on this side well i, I didn't do this but i could theoretically well, like well wait what if the, somebody stole the table oh all right i guess we'll get a card table and some folding right. chairs on me right? <laughs> it's a dumb example but right. the the point is, if we say we're going to go out and do a 1v1, but now one of the things we brief is, hey, if we, if for whatever reason something's broken, we can stay flying, but we can't dogfight, well, then we'll do maybe intercepts instead. So it gives us the ability to have backup plans so we can still be, what, as effective as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the key differences between commercial aviation and, and the industrial world is we make sure we take time to plan and brief, yeah. right? Yeah. In a lot of organizations, hey, why aren't we working? You know, you're wasting time if you're talking about work and not actually generating revenue or doing the work that yeah. generates revenue. Right. You know, it's a leap of faith that if we spend more time planning and briefing and thinking about what we're going to do, that we'll execute more effectively. And in the end, we'll be saving time and being more efficient right. if we actually talk about our work in a meaningful way before we go to work. Yeah. You know, as opposed to just hoping, you know, that people know what they're doing and then, oh, we forgot this tool or we didn't order that part or this vendor didn't show up with the right pump. Mm -hmm. And now everybody's sitting around doing nothing for two hours because we didn't think about the work yeah. in advance. Yeah. 
I have to think, besides the science of it, there's got to be an art, too, in their combat. Because yeah. if you sat in a brief with me to go flying, and I laboriously covered every detail, right. that's going to be lost on you. You're going to tune me out. You're going to be daydreaming, et cetera, et cetera. So it, there's, I think, an art to this science as well. Yeah, there's, there's definitely experience to it, right? And you have to have a good format like, like JJ talks about. You do improve. It's like anything else on the job, right? Sure. You know, you, you're not going to be the best welder the first day you're there, but three weeks later, you're probably going to be pretty good, right? So you get better at it. It's something you improve, mm -hmm. and it's something you also debrief, right? You debrief the, the actual briefer and things that he or she could do to be to be better to pre present the information, yeah. right? As you guys were talking, I was sort of flashing back to the, to the Top Gun briefs when I was going through as a student, <laughs> you know, and they start as hour and a half, like two long, terrible things that last forever. And then by the time you're at the end or once you're on staff or you're at the NSOC staff or whatever, it's a it's a five minute brief, right? Because everybody knows what it, what standard means. So you can go, okay, take off standard, da da da. You talk mm -hmm. about some times, you talk about the weather, and you go, these are the four, these are the four BFM sets we're going to do, and everybody understands the standardization, and it takes ten minutes, yeah, right. So it's just a matter of putting that process in place, and then then holding yourselves accountable to it, and yeah. you very quickly will save time and become much more efficient. Well, you make a good point about standard operating procedures, which we're all again familiar with in military aviation. But I wonder, in your capacity as Check Six, is that another thing you recommend to organizations? Like, hey, let's take a few things that we always do, so we want them to be repeatable and efficient, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And let's just maybe whether it's outline the steps, or if this thing happens as a contingency, this is what we'll do. I've been in squadrons where, hey, look, if you have a planning link indication in your F-18, you're going to take a short field trap because you don't want to slow down and have the wheel pull you off the runway right. and go in the dirt. Or SOP is another thing that uh, you use in your capacity now? Absolutely. And um, again, um, a lot of organizations have policies and, and procedures and things they're supposed to do, whether it's from a safety perspective or an operational perspective that they're supposed to do before they work. Again, the question is how relevant is what they're doing to the task and, and how repeatable and efficient is it, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the typical knee-jerk reaction to something going wrong is add more process, right? Add more paperwork. I've seen organizations, there's 30, 40 pages of paperwork before the, the group can start the job. Mm -hmm. And that 30 pages of paperwork aren't helping anybody, yeah. right? It's yeah. just a, a, a CYA, a, you know, cover your ass for the for management. Um, whereas if we can actually both more humanize and more make it relevant, um, it, it's more effective and, and it's better for the people. I'll give you a great example working with this, uh, an oil company that before the guys start their shift of, of doing drilling or whatever they're doing on, on the drilling rig, they call them, you know, these save your life actions. They're checklists. They're actually checklists. They, they require two-person verification, which we know is, you know, every step. And actually have to physically walk around, look at all the equipment, and a guy says, this is correct, and somebody else has to agree it's correct. Mm -hmm. Initially, that takes time, like Combat was saying. It mm -hmm. takes probably a half hour the first time or, you know, 45 minutes. But once they know what they're supposed to do and what they're looking for, like you said, you know, you just start walking around real quick. Bang, bang, bang. We're good, good, good. And, and again, we're transitioning from I hope everything's okay to I know everything's yeah. okay. Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's the key, that you know when you go to work that the equipment is correct. That doesn't mean something might not break later, but at least when we did our, our pre-flight check, this is even before our pre-job briefing, we're checking everything mm -hmm. um, and we're doing it in a way that's both relevant to the worker and actually effective and efficient. Yeah. Well, and I have to think it sort of harkens back to some of the operational risk management we started doing later mm -hmm. in our careers, where you would look at the severity and the probability, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I would, I would, like I said, sweep the cockpit. And if I missed a switch, for the most part, if I missed it, once I turned on the power or maybe started the engine, I would catch it. So the severity was low. But then there were certain things where, particularly when I was doing the post-maintenance check flights, or if it involved, like you said, uh, earlier combat ordinance or an emergency, mm -hmm. where it was more like what you just described, JJ, which is, okay, hold on. If, if someone's going to die if we get this wrong, then let's slow it down. Because maybe the likelihood is arguably relatively low, but if the severity is super high, then we need these processes in place because we can't afford to just, oh yeah, I looked at it, it was fine, and oops, you know, so-and-so yeah. got killed. Right, That's yeah. obviously bad. Understatement of the year. I relate this story when we're working with organizations, right? 737, there's about 100 things you do to get the airplane ready to go take off. The checklists cover, there's four different checklists that you run before you take off. There's only one item that's covered twice on the checklist, and that's the flaps. 
right? Right. Because out of everything, that's the thing that can. And we still screw it up, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> some but people, once in a while, yeah. you hear about it when. And, 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 and it's also because the 737 still uses legacy paper checklists, right? Yeah. Every other airplane out there, you actually have to push a, a, a digital checklist on the screen that'll turn the boxes green and the airplane won't take off unless all the boxes That's are right. green. It yeah. will not let you set takeoff thrust unless all the boxes are green. And one of those boxes is the flaps are set correctly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so that's, again, the evolution of, of the digital side. And I'm not saying engineering out the, the human error, but reducing the probability of human error tremendously right. because we're using digital checklists instead of paper checklists. Yeah. Well, you'll be happy to know the 757 and the 767 uh, are still paper. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we're with you. I mean, at least yeah. it was a couple of months ago when I flew it last. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hoping to get back to that at some point. When it's I can... actually kind of incredible to me. I mean, I think if you look at the stats, it's like paper checklists. There's like a 10%, you know, however they figure out the, the error rate. And like with digital, it's like 0.7%. I mean, yeah. it's like... It's like a factor of 50. Well, but and, and so, math, yeah, actually, but, this is a good point you make. And let's discuss this both from military point of view and industry, because I bet both have the same issue, which is, well, what's the cost benefit, right? Okay. Uh, in the Navy, we had checklists. And for the most part in the F-18, they were also paper. I made my own copy, put it on my knee board and just mm -hmm. made sure it was kept up to date. But it was paper there. And in my 757 at my airline, I suppose there's an opportunity to buy the technology to put it in every one of those airplanes and then mm -hmm. teach every pilot how to do it. But on the other hand, if what we're doing works, I can see where they could push back on that. Sure. You know, oh, by the way, there's a whole regulatory aspect of that, which yeah, you would have true. to have the old airplane recertified. I mean, that's why the, the 737 MAX still has this terrible overhead panel that's been around in the 737 since the 1968 <laughs> when it first came out, mm -hmm. you know, because they would have to recertify all of that. Yeah. And, and again, that's that's very expensive. And then you'd actually have to have a different typewriting, which means retraining pilots. And, yeah. you know, Southwest Airlines would never allow for that. Um, yeah. They're the number they're the one user of the, the 737. 737. Yeah. And Boeing's not going to hire any of us now, so. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I don't have a resume in with that. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about retiring, not getting rehired somewhere else. But uh, I think another important point, though, about SOPs is, uh, and it's true really for everything we've been talking about so far today, is is how much in the minutia do you get, right? And, and you said earlier, JJ, I always thought some of our immediate action items of our emergencies were a little bit too obvious, right? In other words, like fly the airplane. I mean, right. All right, we always know aviate, navigate, communicate. If you have an emergency, you fly the airplane, you figure out where you're going and hopefully start heading somewhere that makes sense. And then if I'm in my single seat and the two of you are in an F-14, then I'll tell you. Or in your case, you might say, oh, I got to do this thing. And then meanwhile, combat's in the back saying, hey, dude, what's going on? Right. And then you tell them that does have to happen quickly. But I feel like sometimes certain processes and sometimes certain SOPs get into things that maybe arguably we already know as aviators in the first place. The SOP would never say, okay, when you go to the runway, push the nose wheel steering button and use enough right or left rudder to stay on center line of the taxiway. Yeah, we know that. Right. Um, and so I'm overstating the obvious, but I think that's maybe one of the hangups of people, and I'm just now guessing, that people who aren't in this industry, who maybe it's being either brought in or even forced on them, is, well, hold on, you're already telling me to do things um, that I know how to do because this is my job. Do you ever get that sort of pushback when you guys yeah, I mean, do I think, your thing? I think you have to be thoughtful about it, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to have an objective when you're doing it, right? So I would say straight away, if there's any action you take where there could be loss of life, that's a good place to start, you know, kind of go mm -hmm. from there. Life, you know, loss of life or however, whatever your risk. Damage equipment. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. whatever your risk appetite is, right? Okay, we're not willing to lose a million dollars in an accident. So anything that could lose a lose million dollars in an accident is a good place to good place to start around digitizing it, yeah. right? And then I was thinking as as you, you were talking about, you know, trying to fly an airplane in an emergency situation about the, the one time that, that I ejected, where it was, we had a stuck up spoiler and it was coming out of the brake and it was, there was no thinking, right? There was, you got it? No. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> right? What airplane so, is this? It was an F-14, so as wow. you'd expect, yeah. yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Because you're low to the ground, you know, 800 yeah. feet probably? Yeah, we were like 600 feet, yeah. Okay. So. And go fast? No, we were actually, it was a, it was a Comp 2X thing where we were low on fuel. So we came into the brake with the wings out. <laughs> Which you never do, right? It just isn't cool. Come on. Turn downwind. Yeah. DLC didn't work. And then the left outboard spoiler stuck up. The right side failed down. And it was kind of one of these sort of deals. Huh. I mean, 
but there was no, what emergency do we have, right? It was very much a, we're getting ready to hit out of control flight sort of thing. So you can't regulate everything, right? Sure, you, you can't consider every possible contingency. Um, sometimes, you, but by having that culture and, and having discussed, you know, if certain things happen in the brief, you know, okay, this is what we're going to do that may not necessarily fit into a nice bucket. You're able to some point to overcome some of that. Yeah. Right. So well, I didn't know you punched out. Yeah, it was, <laughs> It's not something I like to brag about. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, Hey, it happens yeah. and thank goodness you're here, but yeah. uh, you landed in the water. So yeah. any, any everything issues with any of that? Yeah, no, everything was fine. I picked so, you up right away. And you know, I did I rock and I, so I, there's a set of procedures, right? If you eject that you're supposed to do. I are okay. Right? Yeah. yeah hold like, on. I still remember inflate release. Mm-hmm. Options and Coke fittings. Right. Huh? Yeah. So the first thing that I did was not inflate. It was the first thing I did was drop my raft. And I was like, oh. like, like release it? <laughs> no, you're, no, you pull the oh, handle yeah, so yeah, the yeah, raft yeah. falls away. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking, I'm thinking, get that out so it'll inflate. So um, I, I guess that's what I'm thinking. But in reality, what's not part of IROC that you're supposed to do is actually make sure your parachute is filled up. That's right. So I dropped the raft and I'm like, oh. and I'm like, okay parachute i look up and thank thankfully you know if parachute wasn't open i've already would have been in the water yeah, right sure. so so then i inflated and went through everything else and, and the procedures and then looked down and the wreckage was right below me and then just kind of steered away from the from the wreckage and then just kind of floating and it was just you know i mean it, literally i watched the airplane you know basically go oh, wow. in the water over my shoulder yikes like the least scary thing in the world right because it just happens so fast mm-hmm. right there's no mm-hmm. you're just kind of reacting and then then once I got in the raft, then I was like, oh, God, now this is terrible. Prior to that, it was very kind of, <laughs> what you, just sort of you just sort of deal with it, yeah, right? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. and it's not that any, any naval aviator or Marine aviator or I assume Air Force guys as well, if they ever fly over the water, would do the same thing, right? It all, yeah. it all comes back to the training and, you know, it comes back to a, you know, a, a briefing and a debriefing sort yeah. of culture. Because trust me, there were a lot of debriefs going on after that. So. I would think so. Mm. Out of curiosity, though, since arguably, I, I hope they figured out right away it wasn't pilot error or crew right. error. Right, yeah, they, yeah, they How did. long was it between that day and the day you flew again? Uh, it was about three or four months. It oh, was wow. It was long and it was painful. Were you on deployment? No, we were, were, we were just, on, you were on, the boat, we were on Comp 2X. Oh, that's right, okay. Um, and then we came back and, you know, so they have to do the safety investigation, they have to do the Jagman, right, right. and they do all that. And the, in, the, in the simulator, they're trying to see if you can actually fly the airplane in that configuration, which I remember I was I was with a guy, our Opso Wally, and he did an amazing job of just, it was all rudder, right? Like he's standing on the rudder and you can feel the airplane going like this. And you can feel yourself, and it's just, I mean, it felt like it was going to snap roll. Any second, yeah. Yeah, but I can remember looking down at the, the gas gauge and going, there's no way we can get to Puerto Rico. It's 90 miles away, and we can't land like this, you know, and it kind of goes it goes through your head that fast, yeah. you know, and that all comes back to me, you know, from the naval aviation training and having thought about it, right, like yeah. having a briefing culture and a debriefing culture. Um, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, that saved our lives that yeah. day. So did they end up pulling up the airplane? No, it was like super deep. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. yeah they, yeah. they could. And it was a 14 a, right? So no, nobody was, wanted that piece of well, junk. No, it was, it was, it was actually a B upgrade with a P tit and, oh, and, oh, and, and a lantern man. pot on it. Ooh, really? And it was like, we had like three of those at the time. Right. Oh, so it was bummer. make you pay extra taxes every year to cover the cost of that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. No. So, but to, I guess to answer your question, it took a long time. Like, uh, our, our DCAG at the time, Brick Nelson, actually got me a flight with the Canadian uh, demo team. <laughs> so the, the, the next time I flew was yeah. actually I flew with those guys, and they wow. were amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting, though, because, right, part of what everything you just said is, in my opinion, part of being a quote-unquote professional. Mm-hmm. And being a professional, I think, comes with experience. But at some point, certainly for me in flight school, I wasn't experienced and I wasn't a professional. And I think that's part of some of these processes we're talking about today and the checklist and all that is how do we take someone off the street and give them the culture and the, and the tools they need so that maybe if I had been on my very first flight at the boat and that happened, maybe I wouldn't have handled it the way you did. But hopefully I'd at least had been informed and had been thinking about and existed in a culture where these are the things you need to think about right away. Is aircraft flyable? If not, hey, I'm going to be out of the ejection envelope if I wait too long, right? Because you're yeah. low to the ground mm-hmm. if it shoots you straight down. So all those things you have to think about. And uh, I like to say on the podcast that I think we are, you know, who's it? Waylon Jennings, you know, don't let your kids grow up to be whatever cowboys. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I always say I think fighter pilots are, and I include everyone in that, mm-hmm. are, are just as professional as doctors and lawyers. I mean, mm-hmm. per the song. I had an attorney write the show one time. He goes, I think you give my community too much credit. But the point is, <laughs> There's really a lot 
as an aviator, whether it's at an airline or military or both, where you're expected to be able to think quickly, invoke these things we've been taught without having to like really dig the recesses of our minds. It's got to be right there mm-hmm. and to be ready. To make, and then, oh, by the way, once you get good at everything about your own airplane, you got to learn all about the threat and the threat missiles and, and different things. So, sure, I don't know. It's been, one of my crusades of this podcast is, by golly, we're not just, uh, you know. Cowboys. Um, yeah, yeah, cowboys or mavericks yeah. or whatever, but. I remember thinking this, you know, when we were, when I was in flight school in the mid eighties, right. All the, you know, all the Vietnam guys were the instructors. Oh, okay. They were all like, ah, you guys, are, you know, you have it easy. And <laughs> you know, you know where you are because <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, of the, the, of the yeah, instrumentation. Yeah, yeah. And once you get the GP, you know, INSs and that kind of stuff, which they had some, they six of them were in Vietnam. Yeah. But versus, you know, like when I first taught, my second tour instructor at VF-101, the F-14 training squadron in Virginia Beach, right? Even in the three years from when I finished to when I came back to teach, the evolution of what was expected of the students was a lot higher, mm. right? Yeah. And then, you know, five years after that, I'm a Top Gun. And again, the expectation and the evolution of, of what's being taught is that much higher. I can't imagine. Well, I do know I mean, to a certain extent these days they, the simulation is so good because the airplanes are all digital. They literally take the F-35 flight control software, drop it in a laptop. So you as a student aren't reading a book and getting a PowerPoint presentation about how to change radio frequencies. You're practicing with the actual HOTAS mm. using the actual software and all of that stuff. Yeah. And so what does that allow you to do? You teach the basics a lot faster and then you can just focus on the tactics and, and the hard stuff. Right. And the hard stuff, because the basics, you can get through them so much faster. You know, there's a little bit of the surprise. Oh, my gosh, the Ukrainians are doing so good flying the F-16 already because the simulation now is so good that you can literally at home for three months practice everything other than actually adding power and raising the gear. Yeah. You know, everything else you can practice. Yeah. And because of that, I maintain a sort of another, not crusade, but point I make on this show a lot is I think the demographic of fighter pilots has changed a lot from the Robin Olds and John Boyds right. of the 50s, 60s, 70s into more of a analytical, very forward thinking, taking in a bunch of data. And of course, the young people that are coming into it these days grew up with iPads and iPhones and video games, internet yeah. and yeah. video games and all that. So uh, they're changing, but so is the job, I feel like, a little bit. To an extent, I, I would still argue, people ask me, you know, what were the characteristics of a good fighter pilot, mm-hmm. right? And, and there was just a few things. Um, number one, you have to be smart. That's a given. But there's <laughs> there were a lot of people that were too smart, right? They, if you overthink stuff, sure. you know, the second one, you have to make good decisions quickly take the best decision you can with the information you have, Mm -hmm. i.e., this airplane's out of control, (laughs) we're we're out. We're giving it back to the taxpayers, right? And generally, you know, people were were either kind of good athletes or good outdoorsmen, were like some of the best, you know, that you weren't, didn't mean you have to be the quarterback at Navy or whatever, right? But you're just in general, a lot of people were good athletes, good outdoorsmen, even if physically their body didn't look very athletic, they were athletic, Mm -hmm. right? Because you have to survive the Gs and, and all of that stuff. But it's the... Make the best decision you can with the information you have, right? That's what allowed folks to to be successful in the cockpit. Yeah. And then if that maybe wasn't the best decision, what'd you do? You'd come back and debrief and go, hey, at this point, we made this decision, but we probably should have made that decision. So next time we go out... Same data points, I'm making that decision instead of this decision. I'm going to turn over the hosting duties to you because that's exactly where I want to go next is, right? We've talked about you have the SOPs for how we do business. You have a brief for what we're going to go do today and maybe some things we don't know if it will happen or not. But now we're going to do that. You get in the airplane. You have checklists to keep you doing what you should be doing and handle things that you shouldn't uh, or you need to do if, if necessary. And then when you get back particularly with our experiences at Top Gun. By the way, did you come through when I was there? Yeah. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. Right? You come back, and now, especially at Top Gun, you would debrief the brief. Right. You Mm -hmm. would debrief the flight. You would debrief even things maybe you didn't do, but you could have done, or you did do and, and shouldn't have done. But like I said earlier, I always thought that the brief was your key to success, but your debrief was really your key to learning. Correct. And when you walk away from that, you know what to do next time. There's no question, right? I mean, I, I can remember going through some of those Top Gun um, debriefs. And I think probably the first thing I learned was the flight's never as good as you thought it was, and it's never as bad that, as you thought it bingo. was, right? <laughs> and it's really interesting, you know, when you're able to take, if you say you have a four plane and you're able to put four tapes in at the same time and you can sync them all, 
And now you, we're all mad at your wingman because he didn't do something that you told him to do. Well, that's because maybe you, you said it on the ICS, you didn't say it on the radio, or he's at a low altitude, you're at high altitude, and he just didn't hear you. Mm-hmm. And learning how real world and external events can, can take your, your game plan sideways, and then being able to you know, kind of put that in the back of your head and account for that the next time you go out to the range. Yeah. And then just being really, really hard and honest with yourself. Yeah. You know, I thought one of the great things that you guys drove into us at, at Top Gun was, you know, stop tape, right? Like, if you if you do something wrong, you got a second to say stop tape and say what you did wrong. Or else someone's going to do or it. Or someone's going to do it for, for you, you, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it breeds that in, and it's a little less painful, I think, when you go, oh, yeah, stop tape. That's yeah. poor comms, behind timeline, bad radar work, right? Like, yeah. and it's just that quick. You know, just a quick note on that. That isn't always a good thing. When I started podcasting episodes one through five, I was, in effect, stopped taping on each next episode for the last thing I had said dumb or forgot or right. whatever. And and people were like, dude, take it easy on yourself. Like, oh, this is just our culture, you know? Like, <laughs> right. I'm going to yeah, point yeah. it out before anybody, any of my buddies goes like, Joe, what's this show you're doing? And yeah. why is this so bad? But when I went through Top Gun, I didn't tear it up. There, there wasn't a trophy, but if there was, I wouldn't have won it anyway. The hard part for me was... As much as I felt like I had prepared, felt like I knew what I needed to do, sometimes, just like for me, flying the ball. I mean, I wasn't a great ball flyer. And I wanted to be. I tried. But it just it was a skill I honestly didn't possess. I got better later, but at the beginning. And so it was hard for me to come back and keep my, in a sense, spirits up and be willing to learn mm-hmm. when you just feel like you're just being beat down all, because your radar mech was bad, right? Your communication was wrong and it was to the wrong person mm-hmm. at the wrong time. Uh, you weren't in the right formation. And and so I think you kind of hinted at this earlier, JJ, is particularly I would think in a culture that's not as used to this as we are, is at some point maybe defense mechanisms or, or guards or something come up. And I know for me, it was just like, okay, yeah, I know I suck. I'm trying, but it's just, this is me. Is I have to think that can be somewhat difficult to overcome for people. It is. And that's a leadership challenge for the organization. Yeah. Like we've worked with several clients at Check Six that say, we want a debrief culture, right? All right. You know, we're happy to teach you, but there's two ways that goes, right? If the leadership says, and typically the leadership's in the office, right? Go fix them out there. That's the problem. <laughs> you're not going to have a debrief culture, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Versus if the entire organization says, you know, I am the boss. I'm going to set the example. I'm going to demand debriefs and I'm going to hold myself accountable Mm -hmm. and people are going to see there's no negative consequence to it, then we can establish that debrief culture, right? And it's not, again, a switch you throw. It takes years. We've worked with one client for a decade. And I I will tell you this, they now have a very strong debrief culture. Oh, good. They have two generations of leadership. um, And and a lot of the oil fields very much like the military. Every three years you move around, you move to international locations, you move to different responsibilities, different parts of the organization, et cetera. But you know, once they get through a few cycles of promotions and a few cycles of, of, of moving people around, all of a sudden you have all of middle management has grown up in a debrief culture. Yeah. And very similar to what happened when the Navy adopted, you know, strike fighter tactics instructor program in the mid 90s. Yeah. I was there when we had no strike fighter tactics program. When I went through as a student at Top Gun in 1990, all I knew is the instructors were better than me. And that an F-16 was better than an F-14, right? <laughs> Especially the N. Yeah, the yeah, F-16N yeah. versus an F-14A. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You know, I might as well just go out and eject right now because I'm not going to win this fight, yeah. you know? Yeah. I can't beat him in a turning fight. I can't beat him in a radius fight. And I can't run away from it. Well, then you, <laughs> right. have, to, you have to figure that out before you get to the merge, right? right. Shoot him with the and Phoenix. They, and then they, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, what did it take in the Navy through the 90s and into the 2000s? Now you have... Not just middle management, but all, every admiral in the Navy uh, grew up in SFTI. Yeah. Every single yeah. current admiral yeah. was in the fighter community grew up in SFTI. Yeah. And that's kind of how you change a culture, how organizations <clears throat> change. You know, just like the airlines with CRM. In the late 80s, the, you know, United started CRM. Those captains were like, you're taking away my authority. I've, I'm, you know, and no, we're not taking away your authority. You still sign for the plane. You still make the ultimate decisions. Mm-hmm. But what we're going to let you do is ask your other crewmates and, and the flight attendants, hey, is this the best course of action? What am I missing? How are we going to successfully overcome a pretty minor emergency? There were some massive ones, but, sure. you know, I mean, you go to that miracle on the Hudson, you know, and, oh, yeah. and Sully Sullenberg, right? That was the ultimate example of crew coordination, CRM, 
you know, this this culture of of helping each other out, asking each other, running checklists. You know, the one thing Sully did that that was not an immediate action item is he turned on the APU. Yeah. Right. But that was just somewhere where, okay, we have all this procedure, we have all this process, but he had made the decision beforehand that if I'm in this situation, I'm turning on that auxiliary power unit because I need something to allow me to control the airplane. Absolutely. Right. If I start doing the loss of thrust in both engines checklist, which, you know, has a couple of immediate action items, according to Boeing, I do those. You don't get to the APU until you're seven or eight steps mm-hmm. into the checklist. And now you've got the book out. And meanwhile, you know, the, the ground's getting closer and, that's right. and the yeah. airplane's getting slower. Yeah. Like I said, so that's where, again, procedural discipline culture, well-trained people mm. um, having procedures in process, but then knowing when it's time to do something a little different because this is going to generate a better outcome. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Just, I think, hopefully everyone understood it, but just in case they don't, you said Boeing. Sully was in an Airbus, but you, right. you fly a Boeing. Right, So if, right. You, if you end up in that situation, yeah. Correct. Um, yeah, because... because as with the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines, right? There's what the organization says you can do, and then there's the squadron flexibility around it. Within reason. So Boeing, mm-hmm. yeah, Boeing generates, you know, the basic emergency procedures and the emergency procedure response, but then the airline decides how they want their crews to to execute that. Yeah, and airline pilot, military aviator, same thing. Be able to account for why you decided what you did, just like in your ejection. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, this is what the information we had. And just like in, at least according to the movie, well, maybe you could have landed. Well, yeah, but whoever trains to that, right? Right. He had the wherewithal to give himself the electrical power and some air via the APU, like you said. Hey, look, everyone walked away or swam away. Right. So right. that was obviously a good answer. But I want to, <laughs> but I want to circle back to my own uh, misery, if you will, as far as when I was in those debriefs. When I became a a part of the staff later and was a blue and a red IP, one of the things I learned, because you said the word leadership, which I thought was really good, is if I was in the situation where I was either leading that or I was the red air, is if you see someone who's now not only struggling but down on themselves, then you have to temper, I think, your comments to make sure that you haven't completely shut them off. Because maybe they did do 20 mistakes, but what are the biggest three? And yeah. if we could just work on those three, hey, we're going to mm-hmm. refly this, which is always itself a painful thing to announce. But frankly, reflies were almost as common as passing, I felt like, you know? <laughs> right. um, maybe more so. But, you know, hey, tomorrow we're going to do this. And instead of here's 20 things to think about tonight, here's three. Right. You know, And maybe those three, because if you work your radar better, maybe we don't have to worry about this other mistake you made because you won't be thinking what you thought then because your radar will be giving you the information you need. So I think a big part of a debrief culture, and I think a big part of why debriefing is so effective at Top Gun and in military aviation is because we're able to distill it down into a few takeaways, not a huge laundry list. Right. And I have to think that's got to be applicable for any human being, I would think. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you know, maybe some of what is unsaid in, in your example is the more junior you are, the more sensitive you are to that, right? If you've met, already made that mistake 50 times, you're like, oh, I'm, you know, you're going to be a little more confident about it, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I think that that point's really well taken. And a lot of what we see with with junior folks out in the field is, is the same sort of thing, right? It's it's They don't have that experience to understand that, okay, if I just do these three things right today, today is going to go awesome, mm-hmm. right? But if you have somebody that works with them that can go, if we do these three things right today, this is really going to be awesome. But right? isn't the other side of the bell curve also a problem? The guys who are super senior, maybe they should know better. And maybe pride is now an issue, right? Because when you're new, yeah. it's yeah. Hard, it's easy to get beat down because you're new and you yeah. should be learning this faster. But when you're old, and I just mean age, I just mean experience-wise, right, yeah. like you should know these things. And uh-oh, now it's clear that I don't. So yeah. I, I have to yeah, think you get some pushback there too. Yeah, I think that's some of that's a personality thing too, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Again, working with clients, right? I'll, I'll say... Okay, let's say you're getting on an airplane today and the captain gets on the, the intercom and says, hey, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm not using checklists today, right? right. What are you going to think as a passenger? You want your wife and kids on that flight or your husband and, and you right, know, children whatever? whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, right? And yet here you are, a, a very seasoned and experienced person in your industry, and you're telling folks, I don't need checklists because I know what I'm doing, yeah. right? And yeah. again, I kind of deviate a little bit from the debrief, but the debrief culture allows you to reinforce that you need those things. Yeah. And we worked a project where they were filling um, lubricants, you know, oil, that kind of stuff into various containers to go from from a pipeline to customers in the field, right? Okay. You know, and the head of the union there was like, I've been doing this for 25 years. I don't need a checklist, right? 
because they were trying to prevent spills. That was they were trying to stop people from from overfilling, you know, or spilling stuff, having the valves aligned wrong and spilling stuff, right? Um, and eventually, you know, everybody's running checklists or getting kind of starting to buy in. And then who's the person that has the next spill? The head of the union. <laughs> right. Because he does that was his aha moment. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know what? I probably should do this because I've been doing this for 25 years, you know, and I'm the one who made a mistake. Yeah. You know, and that's how you kind of change cultures and win people over is sometimes they have to have that aha moment and sometimes they have to have that human error. Um, and also management didn't fire him for that. They're like, okay, can we please get you to help us now do yeah. this? And, and they did. Yeah. And they were very successful for a long time. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that I learned at a young age is I view, I think a lot of people view checklists as like big brother, right? It's going to be something that you're going to like hold over my head or, you know, it's some way to sort of control me. In reality, I always found it to be, if you follow the checklist, they can't say anything. And right, it makes, like, easier, right? Yeah. It makes, yeah. it, it makes yeah. it easy, right? So yeah. it's like, you know, did you follow the checklist? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And then if you have it in, in a digital format where you can actually prove it, right? Like, I mean, you can almost take some solace in, in new airplanes knowing there's tapes there. As long as you did everything was right, they'd just go find the tapes and go show the tapes, right? Which is a much different mentality, I think, than what we had when I started as a JO, right? It yeah. was like, burn the tapes, don't turn the tapes on, right? Like, <laughs> those sort of things. But once you get yeah. that, you know, you know, the steps we made from a leadership standpoint in naval aviation across my career, and I'm not taking credit for any of that, I mean, because we all walked on the shoulders of giants relative to that, but the whole attitude has changed so much, right? So it's trying to, trying to change that attitude with these companies and with these folks. And I view all these folks as being professionals, right? Every bit that we are, right? These guys work hard out in the field. They do a lot of stuff that, you know, to be quite frank, we wouldn't do now, right? Yeah. They're professionals and they want to do better and they want to learn, but it's, you just got to give them a little bit of a nudge to let them understand the value to them that we're not trying to take your job, right? We're trying to protect your job and help you be yeah. more efficient and help your company be more successful so you can have a job for a longer period of time. Yeah. It just sounds like pride or whatever you want to call it gets in the way sometimes. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and, and maybe for 24 years or maybe he's had other spills, but not very often. But probably the word that keeps coming up that uh, is most applicable is just culture. He yeah. just didn't, he wasn't raised in an environment like that. And humans resist change. I don't have to tell you to that, but right. hey, why yeah. do we want to do this? And then maybe what you can show them is, hey, look, okay, yeah, you're right. You've had two spills. Maybe I'm just making this up in 25 years. But if you would have used these checklists, you might've gotten an entire career without one. Right. And right. so that little marginal difference is just enough because, again, it's the severity or the probability. Yeah. How severe is a spill? I mean, there's the, uh, what was it, the horizon? Uh, Deepwater horizon? Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. You know, that clearly was pretty a big deal. Right. And so is uh, on an airplane in your scenario, the 30-year pilot. Well, okay, yeah. Let's hope nobody ever says that, by the way. Yeah. But, but if they did, okay, well, now you skip a checklist and, and the plane crashes. And what's mm. the severity of that? Well possibly everybody dies. Right. And oh, by the way, everyone else who has fears of flying, those are now stoked because you never hear about the 3,000 flights a day at each right. one of the major airlines that right. has nothing wrong. Right. Yeah. You only hear about the one every year right. that someone is the killed. jump or, seater tried to shut the engines off. Or whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what's the stats? It's if American commercial aviation, you're just spot, but tighter on this than I am, if they had at 99.9% safety rate, we'd lose like 400,000 people a day in the U.S.? No, no, no not 4 yeah. You'd lose, you'd have four major accidents a oh, week. Oh, is it four accidents a week? Okay. Yeah, well, something like that. Yeah, it's 99.99. Yeah. I mean, you can do the math, but right. it's yeah. out to, I mean, really the last, you know, pilot error hull loss for mainline United Delta American was in, in 2000 in uh, New York. Uh, oh, American the, Airlines, when, you know, when they were with the letter. Yeah, letter. it was right after 9 11. Right after 9 no 11. Yeah. And initially it was like, oh my gosh, another terror attack. And it yeah, wasn't. That was, it wasn't. But that was, you know, there's there's been a couple commuters, you know, Kentucky, Buffalo, mm -hmm. a couple others that were pilot error. But for the majors, it's an unbelievable safety record. Yeah. It it's really unbelievable. Is. And why is that? Well, the airlines focus on two things maintenance, reliability, specifically keep the engines turning, mm -hmm. you know, and crew coordination. Training the crew to land the plane, yeah. right? What did Sully do? You know, they landed the plane. They landed the plane safely. And everybody walked off of that plane. You know, not completely in any way anybody had imagined. Yeah. But, <laughs> or but, would want to do again. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so, again, the resistance from other organizations is, is just not their culture. Yeah. And it's hard to change that culture. And, and part of our challenge at Check Six is, who are you? Why are you here? What do you know about my job? Mm -hmm. We had a prowler pilot and uh, and another guy on the project, a Hornet guy, and they're telling this, 
you know, 25 year worker how to improve their work. And that's a that's a hard sell. Well, but that, you know, it's one yeah. thing if you're a student at Top Gun and yeah. you got you know Yarko standing there with two thousand Top Gun hours telling you this is how you you know ditch the airplane and do a defensive BFM maneuver versus hey, 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 I'm Yarko yeah. from the Navy. I'm here to make your life better. Yeah. You know? Well, part of that is that culture we keep coming back to because yeah. when you go to Top Gun as a student, boy, you better be receptive to that. Because, <laughs> right. But if you're just in your job and all of a sudden today's flavor of the week is we're bringing in this company to uh, tell you how to do your job better. I think I have to think the initial response is, okay, we don't need that. We're right. doing fine. Right. Yeah. 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 If the leadership's bought in, it's one thing. Right. But when they say right. fix those people over there, you know, then <laughs> yeah. it's an uphill fight. Yeah. Well, so let's transition to that because clearly you have a culture within naval aviation where we're talking about, right, here's how we can make processes or improve them. We can brief before we go do something to make sure we have the best chance of success. When we're doing it, we're going to use checklists to make sure we're effective. And when we get back, we're going to look at what we did and we're going to walk away with something that we can say we do better next yes. time. Mm -hmm. And part of that, oh, by the way, uh, this has also been a difficulty for me is to acknowledge the things you do. You got to acknowledge the wins. Right. Also. right. Yeah. You walk away with what can I do better tomorrow, but you have to acknowledge those wins. So I don't know. I don't know that much about the history of check six. Tell me where it began. Someone, what, got out of the Navy and said, I think this could be adaptable to other industries. So uh, Brian Brew, Red Brew is, you know, another Tomcat guy. Okay. Um, and I kind of had a similar path where we both got out of the Navy in about 15 years. We both went to the airlines. We went to FedEx. I went to United. We both went to the Guard. He went to the Arkansas Guard at Fort Smith flying Vipers. I was flying Vipers in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, we were doing some work with a different military-themed event company, Afterburner out of Atlanta. Okay. Anyway, um, great, great company. Still, you know, d does really fun corporate training events. And they did one for a deep water drill ship. And they're like, hey, can you guys, that was great what you did in the hotel. You know, we had a fun afternoon. Can you guys come out to the rig and help us? Mm. For whatever reason, they didn't want the work and, and we did. And uh, and so we kind of started out on our own. Hmm. You know, three people around a card table in 2007. At one, uh, you know, today we probably got 160 people working all over the world. Uh -huh. And not just Americans, we have we have a big operation in Malaysia, for example. That's all Malaysian military. We have a couple fantastic retired Portuguese military officers that work in Europe for us. We got a French guy. We got some Americans that live as expats that work for us. Uh, English guy, you know, English special forces, British special forces guy that lived in, lived in the states and now just moved back to the UK. Right. So it's just uh, this international conglomerate of people of similar experience that are passionate about teaching and, and helping folks uh, in, in other organizations to apply some of these best practices. Yeah. But how does it work? Because if you're going to show up on that ship or or some maybe new to you industry, right? When you go to Top Gun, you've already been flying, in your case, an F-14. They're going to work you up even higher to hone those skills, and then you're going to teach that. But when you go out, in your example, uh, on that ship, that's a whole new environment. I mean, do you have to do some background on on what it is, or or do the principles apply regardless of what it is? Yeah. So depending depending on the industry, we have our own syllabus syllabi, um, so we can give give the newer coaches some you know experience before they go out there. Then we tend to try to put them with another coach that has extensive experience in that industry. Okay. So then they they more or less you know do a, a brief and you know execute during the day, and they do their own personal debrief at night to. You know, hey, I didn't understand, you know, when, when they say they, they do this, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of cross training that goes on. So, you know, we're constantly training ourselves as well as, yeah. you know, helping our clients. Yeah. But but yes, and what are we really leveraging? The 22, 24, 22, you know, 24 years of leadership experience that you got at the hands of the American taxpayer. Right. And I say, you know, you walk into a squadron, walk onto a ship, walk into a you know, a military unit somewhere, within about five or 10 minutes, you get a pretty good sense of the culture and whether this is a strong organization or whether this is an organization that is perhaps not led as well as it should be. Mm -hmm. The very same thing applies with all of our clients. I've walked into steel mills, fertilizer plants, manufacturing facilities, oil rigs, and you very quickly get a sense of the strength of the leadership and the tone of the culture, right? And that's something you can't, reading a book or train yeah. somebody to do. That's what we're leveraging is those years and years of experience. Uh, and, you know, obviously we do, you know, train folks up to be in that particular industry, but what are you truly leveraging is, is like I said, Jell-O's 
plan, brief, execute, debrief, culture, and experience. Then the how do we continuously improve and how do we teach people how to continuously improve? Yeah. And uh, you'd be surprised the similarities, right? Like uh, yeah. the f- first site I went to was a mine in Arizona, right? Like you walk into what would be their maintenance control and you just look around and you're like, wow. Just right? because like, it's there's no, there's no or... order, you know, okay. like, oh, if you need a part, where are you going to get the part from, mm-hmm. right? Like, there's no communication. They don't talk about what we're going to do today. You know, despite having different groups that all have to be coordinated. And so many of the programs that you have in, in naval aviation maintenance, they have there as well, right? Like, they have a tire and wheel. Like, as an example, you know those big Tonka trucks, those giant tires? Yeah, yeah. Those tires are like 120 grand a piece, <sighs> right? And it takes six people to change one of those tires. So... If you can just improve your tire and wheel program by one tire a quarter, you save half a million dollars a year, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and the numbers are, are staggering like that, right? right? So the impact that we can have inside of a couple hours in right. a lot of cases is is really phenomenal. It was eye-opening to me yeah. because I just assumed that industry would be you know, a little ahead of where we were. Squared away, yeah. yeah. Nah. But when it comes right down to it, you walk in, people are people. Right. Yeah. And have different sizes, shapes, mm-hmm. colors, and bents. Mm-hmm. But people are people and they're going to be motivated by certain things and afraid of certain things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then ideally, if they're all in one organization, they're theoretically aligned to do something. And yeah. then it's just a function of finding out what that something is. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's always going to be little side uh, folks going against the grain or whatever. And then you've got the risk. And the risk could be something as big as death or a spill, yeah. environmental issue, or it could just be, look, we're spending a half a million dollars more a year than we could be, right. and that goes to the bottom line. So mm-hmm. ultimately, yeah, I can see where you might need to learn some of the nuances of being in a mine versus being on a ship, but when it comes right down to it, it's people and processes and fears and hopes and aspirations and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah and, and there's this perception that the government's massively bureaucratic and inefficient and that you know there are a lot of cases of that but there's also key parts of it i.e elite military units where some of the process is really strong and it's based on this you know lessons learned in blood and all of that Mm -hmm. and those process and procedures or aviation maintenance right how do we take a kid from you know, let's say Kansas, who's never been in the military, never been in the Navy, never been on a ship, never worked on an airplane, and five months later, they're qualified to change a hydraulic actuator, right? How do you get there? Yeah. Strong process, strong procedures, strong leadership, and and a consistent checks and balances. Hey, at this stage, somebody's going to come out and quality assurance check the work. At this stage, we're going to do all of that. And then, again, you go to these organizations that are making hundreds of millions of dollars a year sometimes and you walk into their supply room and it's a disaster in fact our normal consulting engagements start with what we call an assessment just kind of get a flavor of what's going on yeah so like you knew the general or the admiral was coming to the base because they would paint all the rocks in front of the headquarters right (laughs) right i always go show me the supply room show me the warehouse show me the tool trailer and then you get a sense of how professional the organization is. And that's part of how I debrief with the with the, the assessment with the customer is I'll go, hey, here's a picture of your tool trailer. It's a disaster. Yeah. Compared to here's one of one of your other company's rigs or whatever. Look at this trailer. Well organized, clean, you know, and, and you just go, okay, there's there's a level of professionalism there, right? Same thing in the steel mills. Some of those repair shops were pristine, warehouses pristine, well organized. Others were literally piles of of some of the parts in there were 100 years old <laughs> that were never going to get used because that equipment's long gone yeah, but it's still there it's still there yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think jj used the term elite mil- you know elite military units I, I would put the guys that work on the deck of an aircraft carrier and, and naval aviation maintenance in that yeah. right and it, it still surprises me that like the procedures that our guys use on the boat just moving airplanes around like that that's not classified <laughs> right, like it took us seven years to seven years to be as good at that as what we are, right. and we just give that away. <laughs> right, like what those guys do every day and gals do every day and night on the deck of an aircraft carrier, and, and the magic that they work in maintenance, or even an unrep. God forbid I give the swos any credit. Underway right, like replenishment. Yeah. underway yeah. replenishment. Yeah. The fact that that stuff's not like double top secret, you know, is it, it blows my mind, right? Because that that right there is really the power of the aircraft carrier, right? Is being able to launch one every 45 seconds and do 100 sorties a day, yeah. you know, and sustain that. And that's not us sitting in an airplane, right? Yeah. Well, and like you said, that's the processes that have been honed over 100 mm-hmm. years of carrier aviation, actually. We had Sarge on the show and uh, yeah. me. Um, but also learning from when mistakes are 
mm-hmm. when they do happen, mm-hmm. and then trying to improve processes. But then every once in a while, you come up with a new ship like the Gerald R. Ford, and so some things you got to learn over again. Yeah, right. but, so, though the blocking and tackling is still the same. There you go. You got to taxi the airplanes around. You got to chain them down. You can't let them go over the side, and you got to hook them up to the catapult. That hasn't changed. Yeah. Again, what happens before flight operations start? All the yellow shirts get together and do what? Brief. That's right. What happens at the end of the day? They all get together with the aircraft handler and debrief, right? I mean, they do it, Mm -hmm. and they may even do it between cycles sometime, you know, between launches and recoveries on the carrier. I mean, this culture of planning, briefing, execution, and debriefing isn't just for the pilots. It's for everybody, you know, on those ships. I don't know if they do it in the laundry. I know they have a morning, you know, meeting, and they talk about who's doing what. But I'm just saying that continuous improvement, the, the constant turnover of personnel, that's the only way to survive it. And again, with, you know, these these other organizations emulate some parts of it, but there's certainly a lot of parts that, that we were indoctrinated in or that we can help share yeah. and improve what they're already doing, right? Because, yeah. again, anybody, whether a pilot or a, or a mechanic or, a, you know, a, a frontline oil field worker— what they don't want to do is have be in a meeting that's wasting their time. That's right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You don't want, and that's inefficiency. Yeah. And that leads to distraction and and, and lost opportunity. You know, yeah. and and so that's where, again, if you can make it quick, thorough, and valuable, then you're helping them. Yeah. And you said earlier uh, you had an example of a, a company that took 10 years, but they're finally, I guess, uh, doing pretty well. Does it take some time? And is there resistance? Or for the most part, people open to, hey, the pros from Dover. I never knew what that expression meant, but it's a, it's a useful one. Uh, are here. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah why right? Dover? I don't know. I have no clue, but someone does. But at any rate, right? Hey, these guys are here. They're from an industry, arguably, right, naval aviation, that does this well, and they're going to offer us some insight. Is it quick, and how how is it received, generally speaking? It comes back to, to, again, the leadership, Okay, and it takes time. Yeah, People ask, how long is this going to take? At least six months. But if they're asking that, doesn't that already tell you something? That either means they're bought in or they're— worried that yeah. that ain't going to happen. Like, how long do I have to outlast you? Yeah, exactly. Okay. With, yeah. Like, with you and like chili here. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the thing. And, and again, if the, you know, this organization has been on this path for 10 years at the time, their vice president, the guy who's in charge of all of this made a, we're doing a lot of stuff good, but we don't debrief. We don't have open communication on improvement. Mm-hmm. We still blame and punish instead of learn and improve, mm-hmm. and he wanted to reset the culture. Yeah. And again, we were there for a few years, then we were gone for a few years, and then we came back, you know, and uh, it's like, all right, this stuck. It actually stuck. Yeah. You know, and, and he, had, he had by then retired, and I actually called him up and go, hey, Dave, it's there. Your legacy, it's still there. They're doing it. That's good. Uh, and nobody's been pushing this, and, and he, yeah. was, he was pretty thrilled. But would you agree with me this is a— thesis on my part. And I'll use Top Gun as an example. When Top Gun was formed, just for whatever reason, they had the right people, the right circumstances, the right chemistry, the right parts. Some of it they had to, of course, uh, get through various weird uh, ways. But it created a culture in that organization that here we are almost 55 years later is still incredible. Now, again, for those who haven't lived it, don't rely on Top Gun Maverick or the first movie. Uh, <laughs> Especially you know, the first movie. Yeah. But, but the point is, you've got this amazing work ethic. You've got this brief and debrief culture. And I guess what I'm getting at is I think Top Gun is fortunate. And I know I was, and I'm sure you would agree, that they have that culture and that it was imbued in the organization from the beginning. How do you take an organization that doesn't start like that and try to get it to that level? Because I feel like if the level of energy to do what Top Gun and all the folks who founded it did was X, I feel like to take a company that doesn't do that and get it to the same level is 2X or 3X or X squared or something. I get the sense that there's a lot of inertia maybe or resistance or something. And so Top Gun is fortunate that they started that way. Can other organizations get there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think... You know, I used to say that it takes a year and a half to build a good maintenance department and it takes six months to destroy it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it's little wins, right? And daily little wins, developing trust and then letting people, you know, start to, you know, 
drink. But even then, that the culture Kool-Aid. probably changes slowly. I feel like. Yeah, I think it does for because sure. Because some of those people remember the old way, and it was right. easier, and I could yeah. roll in late and leave early. You and... know, and then people love to problem solve, right? Which is a disease in and of itself because we're trying to prevent problems, right? Mm-hmm. So we always reward people that fix problems. In reality, we should be thanking the guy who never has problems. Mm-hmm. It's small wins. I think you've you've seen it in your time in the Navy. I'm sure you know on on staff, so you have a squadron that's struggling a little bit, or you have a maintenance department that's struggling, or an operations department. Right. And you just go in and it gets to JJ's comments about leadership as well. Right. When we go in, we partner with with the management of a company. Right. And it's a journey that we take together with them. You know, and we do daily brief debriefings with their management as well to go, hey, what do you think of today? You know, what can we do better? Do you think maybe you're a little harsh on that guy? Right. So it's, you know, you you almost look at it like we we call them coaches, uh, coaches and consultants, and they really do, you know, coach leadership and best management practices. Mm -hmm. Very often when an organization is struggling, what do they do? Change management, right? Fire the skipper, <laughs> right. you know, fire the maintenance yeah, officer, yeah. you know, and bring in other leadership because that's yeah. the key to success. And you see the same thing in industry. Yeah. You know, you'll see organizations, you know, that we've worked with that it's like both, hey, after a while, we're doing a lot of coaching, mentoring, training, and things aren't getting better Then maybe they shake things up, yeah. you know, or the other part, we've also had people say, hey, yeah, we want you to work with us, but we got to make a change first because before you guys can come. And that change is they're replacing some of the senior management because they already know it's broke, oh, yeah. right? And they're going, well, I don't, we're not going to spend any money fixing that person. Let's bring in the new leadership, give them a little time to get some, to get to know the organization, and then we'll bring in Check Six to kind of help them, you know, establish a new culture. Yeah. And that, again, you know, that establishing the new culture is easy, with, with the right leadership. The hard part is to have it stick if that leadership moves on. Yeah. Because again, if, you know, a huge company with 80,000 employees, the successful managers move up quickly and now somebody in comes in to replace them and then they might be like, well, that wasn't my idea. We're not going to do that yeah. anymore. You yeah. know, yeah. in spite of the fact that, hey, the person that was in your chair before just got promoted because they improved the culture. Now you're going to destroy it. <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. I don't think that's unique to industry. It sounds like <laughs> commanding officers yeah. will do that in squadron. Absolutely. Sure. And as you said, it's so much easier to go with a negative than it is to uh, yeah. make the improvements, I yeah. feel like. But, uh, and that goes back to like the SFTI, the Strike Fighter Tactics program, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you take it out of the hands of a lot of it out of the hands of the leadership because now you have a standard that's template. Right. This is what it takes to be a flight leader in the Navy or the Marines. This is what it takes to be a division leader. This is what it takes to be a mission commander, right? Yeah. You've set a baseline standard and you've taken a lot of that, I wouldn't say not even judgment, but you've actually, it makes it easier for the CO. Then he has doesn't have to decide if I like combat or don't right. like combat, if I'm right. going to give him the qualification or not, mm-hmm. you know. An independent evaluator from the weapons school has come and said that you are qualified or you are not qualified. Yeah. It makes it a lot easier to maintain a, a, a performance execution standard. I mean, I think if you take the SFTI thing now and you have what, level three was what, like 16 flights or something? To yeah, it was a team. lot, yeah. So you take 16 grade sheets that basically all have the same information, right? right? Like communications, brief, debrief, all that sort of information and employment stuff, obviously. And then you you take all the data that you get from that, and then you turn around and you go, okay, well, what are we good at as a community and what are we not good at? And then how do we improve on those things that we're not good at? And it gets back to, is it is it, is it a machine issue, right? If we Maybe if we had a missile that had a little longer, you know, we had an AMRAM that went 50 miles, maybe that would be something worth investing in because then we'd see better success, right? So I, I think that what you guys did with SFTI and, and how you basically took the first steps in digitizing pilot performance against standard criteria is, yeah. you know, is really paying off. Yeah, I think that's been pretty well documented that yeah. that was a success. And not to say that what they had before that was wrong or a failure, right? Again, Top Gun came out because, hey, we're getting our rear ends kicked. Right. right. We need something. And then they did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I read about it in Brad Elward's book, you know, the Malibu Conference. Right. Hey, hold on. Now we should maybe do something a little different. So it's, it's constantly hopefully evolving and changing. I assume you do too, right? I mean, your methodologies, you learn mm-hmm. things every time you have a client. Absolutely. What worked, what didn't. You probably debrief your own debriefs. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Of, course, of course we have. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, we have some hard lessons learned. Yeah. I mean, some really hard ones from an individual coach execution to an organizational execution to a customer service and sales. Yeah. You know, that. You learn these things, and you know, as new people enter the organization, we're very careful to, to be sure that they are f- 
shown those lessons learned and understand those lessons learned and are taught that so we don't make the same mistakes that we made early on in the company. Yeah. And you talked earlier about some of the different, I'll just say consequential companies, and I'm thinking of that term because of they could have environmental disasters or deaths or different things. But is something like what Chexix does applicable to an industry that's making paper products maybe or or diapers or, I mean, uh, other things that maybe are, I mean, people can still get hurt if a machine is involved. Yeah. You know, my oldest brother lost the tip of his finger on a little machine when he was a kid. Um, so, right, people can always get hurt. They'll find a way. Yeah. Right? And we can always have environmental disasters, even with ink or, or cotton, per, presumably, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is this a process that can apply to anything or just the sensational ones, you know? Absolutely at anything. Yeah. We've, we've worked with small town government. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the outliers we've yeah. had. Worked with a, a parks system, you know, community park system in a county. You know, so anything in humans, deadlines, Processes. Uh, processes, <laughs> yeah. you know. Especially uh, humans. Yeah, yeah. anything <laughs> with humans. Yeah. yeah, and then you get onto the manufacturing, you know, window manufacturing. We sent two Marine Har Harrier guys into a window manufacturing plant. They knew nothing about manufacturing, knew nothing about the window business. They had five days to show an impact. And they did yeah. by building some checklists mm. for them. These big window manufacturers, they'll set a machine up to make windows that are, you know, two feet by four feet, right? And they'll make like 50 of them. Then they got to reset the machine to build 50 of a different size. Well, that reset process, you know, if you don't do it exactly correctly, the first time you put the raw materials in, it'll break it, you know? And so now you've got law, you got to clean it up. You've lost that raw material, blah, 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 right? Mm. We sped up the reset process and improved its effectiveness, you know, by using a checklist you know, that, that ensured that they did it correctly. And it went from 45 minutes to seven minutes. Wow. Because now if I do this, I'm confident I'm doing it correctly and I'm going to do it in this exact order. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, there's always something, you know, and these guys are, they've been doing it a long time. They're a very successful business, but there's just ways to help them be a little bit better. Yeah. When I was about ready to retire and I was at the depot uh, here in San Diego, that was a very intensive uh command because of the manufacturing and the processes and all that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they would hold were these different classes on uh, like lean process and yes. mm -hmm. Six Sigma. Six yeah. Sigma, exactly. And then mm -hmm. there was a bunch of like Japanese terms like poke yoke or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, Kaizen where, walks. Kaizen, yeah, and all that. So is that, is that yeah, related yeah, 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 to what yeah, y'all yeah, exactly. do or is it kind of parallel? or how, Because like one of them, right, was, for example, and you see this a lot now, is a plug will only go in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. So that yeah. you don't mess it up. Yes, they don't right. Or, yeah. hey, everybody's green. Oh, he's red light. Let's go over there and figure out what his problem is. Yeah. Is it a similar industry or, or is that something different than what y'all do? It's complimentary. Yeah, it's complimentary. Okay. We, we have some coaches that are qualified to do that as well. So okay. if a client would like, you know, those services, we can offer that as well. You know, yeah. but that's that's more process directed than, than leadership, which I think is okay. culture. Yeah. Again, there's plenty of people that can identify process gaps, right? Or places to improve performance. There's lots of, you know, McKinsey, Accenture, you know, they'll you come in. just move your toolbox over here and yeah. right. save the steps yeah. back well, and forth. Yeah. Or more, you're in the bottom quartile in terms of revenue per employee, right? Okay. You know, yeah. so yeah. you need to fire a third of your employees and now your revenue will, will <laughs> right. be at the top quartile, right? Yeah. But the hard part is, again, the, the people on the front line, you know, the people at the tip of the spear, as we would say in the Navy, how how do you change their life that improves all of that? Yeah. You know, and they'll identify that, you know, this is the Lean Six Sigma. This is the, if every job's taking three minutes and this job takes four minutes on the assembly line, then we got to re redo our assembly line. So every job takes three minutes so the car can move to the next station, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's, again, you can identify that, but it's the working with the frontline folks. Okay, how do we change that three minutes so it's so it's more efficient? And, and like I talked about the window, setting up those machines. Another one we, we did with a client is they have all these workers in the field that go out and check all this equipment scattered across hundreds of square miles. And whether it's a, a generator or a compressor or something, right, these are machines and some of them are linked in and some aren't, but the people go out in the field and, hey, I added four quarts of oil and they put it on a piece of paper. Hey, I added this or that. Well, that piece of paper will end up in a box at the That's main right. office, yeah. maybe, right. you know, probably in Hopefully. the guy's car for two weeks, yeah. then in a box at the main <clears throat> office, right? There was no, so you digitize that. You build a digital checklist and all that information needs to go on paper, gets put into a, a digital database, 
And now you can start trending. Now you can mm. do what, what Keith was talking about, which is going, this machine is starting to consume twice the oil it did last month. Let's go service it bef mm. before we have a serious malfunction and we've lost an $800,000 right. piece of equipment. Right. You know, that's going to be down for weeks because it's not like they got spares sitting on the shelf. Right. You know, it's going to take a while. And that's that's the kind of stuff, again, as as what, you know, the culture we were raised in that this makes no sense. We're, we're gathering information. It's the 21st century. We're gathering information and we're putting it on paper and we're putting it in a box. <laughs> that's not helping anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I stand by the importance of, as you just said, that where we grew up and, and the processes and everything we've talked about today. But I think also it's worth acknowledging that sometimes just an outside look at something, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's... Uh, I can remember preparing a board for one of our briefs in one of the squadrons, and I'd looked and looked and looked at the thing or the kneeboard card itself, and someone would come in like, that's wrong. And you'd look at it like, dang it, yeah, how did I... I looked right. at it 20 times. Yeah. So I think sometimes just an outside view can yeah, also be effective. Again, it's been... It's been really enjoyable to, yeah. you know, to, to share some of the, the training and, and the knowledge that we have with, with other organizations. You might have said yeah. earlier, but is that your roles? Are you coaches, as you as you put it, or do you have other roles in the company? I put founder, director on my uh, signature block, but basically, you know, we both, he's, he's the vice president. You know, we both sell, we both manage our teams, we both manage client projects. He runs our software division in terms of improving the checklist software. So it's, there's a whole lot of, what hat am I wearing this hour? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I manage our biggest customer and try and, you know, regrow our business with them. Yeah. I mean, it's just a lot of, you, you do whatever it takes that day. We're very lean. You know, the, the top of the or pyramid only has about eight people on it, basically, yeah. and it's pretty flat. Yeah. So it's shifted from a, we used to kind of run it like a squadron, you know, and now we run it like a professional services consultancy where you have, you know, the equivalent of a partner that's got clients that generates business and they have their team and blah, blah, blah. Smart. Well, what's the future for Check6? Is it more of the same? Or are they looking to branch out in any new directions? Or I think from a technology standpoint, we're, we're really focusing on analytics and we're looking to see how machine learning can help improve the processes that our clients use around Use, use it around our digital checklist tool, mm -hmm. right? So it's really it's really interesting what we've seen so far in terms of being able to see patterns that the three of us wouldn't see. You know, we, we do a little bit of machine learning on top of on top of some of our dashboards, and it's really interesting how you can improve yeah. improve processes for clients. I could think, right? If I were hiring you as a company, I would want you to be sort of on the leading edge of some of these things, right? If you came mm -hmm. in and and you had paper products, yeah, I right. say, well, who are these guys? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they're not from Dover, yeah. or they're not the pros. But yeah. so yeah. all right, so that's that's yeah, what so keeps all, you up. So yeah, so all of our coaches use our product, use use our yeah. digital checklist tools yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So. But but again, you're like machine learning is the better term for artificial intelligence. I, th I think I in this example, in th think in this example, right? yeah. But it's, yeah. it's, so I just did a seven hour drive up to uh, go fishing of all things. Mm -hmm. um, but I was listening to Freakonomics, great podcast. Yeah, right, yeah. And they had a three part series on artificial intelligence because mm -hmm. I just feel like it's one of those things I don't know enough about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to learn. And, and one of the points they made was, eh, maybe it's more machine learning. But one of the takeaways from it is probably a lot, like you said earlier, it's not as bad as you thought. It's not as good as you thought. Right. It's probably not going to kill us all, but we're probably not all going to just be able to turn into Wally people and just sit around and, and just do what we want and, and get old and fat. But it, it is going to change things, it sounds yeah. like. And yeah, so yeah, you guys are sure. staying in front of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, what about the future for you guys? You're flying at United, you said, but are you, you're not doing any F-16 stuff, are you? No, okay. no, no. Because can't you stay at a guard unit like for almost forever? You could stay. In theory, you can fly till you're 55 <laughs> okay. in the guard. You know, now I got to a point where it was, uh, you know, I'd done enough, seen enough. Yeah. And, uh, and it yeah. was kind of like, you know, this. I would tell you this, if there's an opportunity to go to my parents' homeland and help out with F-16s, I'd, I'd be right on top of it. Uh -huh. Well, we should mention that we're <laughs> recording this at the end of uh, October, and if you're from Israel, I take it, you... Uh, <laughs> no, no, Ukraine. Ukraine. Oh, Ukraine? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, hey, they're getting F-16s. They are, yeah, in fact. Yeah, yes, yeah. they are. Okay. So, anyway, yeah, there's, uh, even if it's not in the flying world, just, uh, you know, just... To, I think a lot of Americans ended up over there. Yeah, they, a couple they have been killed. Yes. It's just, it's been fascinating to watch the speed and the effectiveness of a lot of their weapons employment. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and... Putting harms on Fulcrum. Yeah, putting harms on Fulcrum, <laughs> putting Storm Shadows on, on Su-24s, you know, I mean, 
for all of us that are, you know, military professionals and understand, you know, or, or thought we knew how a war may be fought in the future, we have now seen the war of the 21st century yeah. that drones, nothing is safe anymore That's on the right. battlefield. That's right. Nothing is safe. And, and the other part is, which we know this, and, you know, the Ukrainians do not have air superiority. So, therefore, to attack without air superiority is almost impossible mm -hmm. to attack effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, that first column they sent with, you know, a couple Bradleys and a couple Leopard tanks, two, two KA-52 helicopters popped up and popped them with at, from five kilometers away with, you yeah. know, laser-guided missiles, right, mm -hmm. and just knocked them out. And again, if you don't have air superiority, it's really hard to attack. What are Ukrainians literally doing now? Driving their vehicles up as close as they can, dismounting troops and having them clear trenches on foot, uh -huh. right? That's where they're at. And that's why the offensive is, is so slow, because the minute you go behind the, the flot, the forward line of troops, you're a target. You know, a vehicle is a target. Yeah. So it's just been fascinating to watch that. I don't think there's enough drone manufacturing capacity around the world to keep up with how many drones are getting shot down over there huh. every day and, and lost, you know. Do you have family still there? Yes, and some friends, actually, people I grew up with that— you know, went over there to run businesses and, and have families and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I do I do keep in touch. And uh, and also, like I said, on the military side, there's always somebody reaching out and going, hey, I need help with this or help yeah. with that. Yeah. We've helped, you know. Some I got connected with a former Marine uh, that was making match-grade ammunition for Ukrainian snipers, right? Or regular, apparently, I don't know much about being a sniper, right? But apparently just regular bullets like for— uh, they're just not accurate enough. They're not accurate enough because yeah. the because the ammunition right. isn't made precisely right. enough. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's the kind of stuff that there's literally thousands of people all over the world that are doing to help. Doing what they can. To help. We have some patches on the wall behind you from an Air Force fellow who sent them to me because I promoted his effort to take old flight gear. Right. And oh, send yeah, it to the pilots. Cave. Yeah. yeah. So we sent in, uh, well, we put it on our social media, but we had people send in old flight suits, old boots to keep their aviators dressed right. and, uh, and going. So he sent me a couple things to put on the yeah, wall back there. I've got like cruise boxes somewhere full of that stuff. Let me know later. I'll well, get you the information. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know if they're still taking it. I assume they are because they're still fighting. Yeah. And they're yeah. still training lots yeah. of people. I mean, yeah. you know, they have attrition like everybody else. Oh, yeah. And, you know, let's say, okay, I'm going to pick five of my experienced combat pilots and send them to Belgium for four months for yeah, 16 learn, training. Yeah. You're losing five assets on the yeah, front line. Yeah. You know, talked to somebody over there a few weeks ago and he was like, yeah, my guys are doing three sorties a day. You know, wow. three sorties a day. Two, two was hard in training. Three combat sorties a day? Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, what's the future for you? You're going to still do the check six stuff? Yeah, yeah, and... absolutely. I'm, I'm in a position where I like both of my jobs. I like flying planes and I, and I love doing check six and I love, you know, check six. We've paid over a hundred million dollars in wages to military veterans wow. in our history. Right. You're, I would think you're primarily a military veteran. Yeah. Right? 80 or 90% of our yeah, folks, wow. like I said, yeah. so it's our military veterans. So that's probably the proudest thing I have is that we've, you know, whether people are still with us or have moved on or industry cycles, sometimes people had to, you know, I had to let some people go and that's hard letting some of your friends go. Yeah. That's one of the hardest things I've had to do. The fact that folks come in to get a good transition, you know, into industry or, or whatever. And, and that's been, like I said, a bit, we've been extremely proud of that. In fact, uh, we're going to be recognized, you know, we're here publicly in a few weeks as a uh, a higher vets medallion winner from the general services or U.S. government. I forget which office, actually. I think it's its Department of Labor, you know, where, where they recognize companies that hire a lot of veterans. And mm -hmm. so Check 6 will be a platinum medallion winner yeah, all right. for the higher vets uh, 2023. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay. How about you, Combat? Keep doing the same Just thing? keep on doing it. Is that your main Turn this into deal? a software company. Yeah. Okay. These, these guys laugh. I want to turn us into a software company. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, which is which we want to be a software company, too. We've just not been very good at it so far. Ah, well, yeah. you got to stick with your core competencies. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll get it sorted. Yeah, fantastic. So for sure. And where can, if people want to maybe apply if they're veterans or maybe have you come take a look at their organization, where can they learn more? I assume you're on the website, of course, and yeah. social media. And www.checksix.com. C-H-E-C-K-S-I-X, one word, Dot com. Okay. Not all caps. No, <laughs> not like Top Gun. Not yeah. like Top right. Gun. All one right. word, all caps. Are you guys on X and Facebook? and uh, uh, LinkedIn primarily. Okay. Yeah. That's more of the professional. Yeah. Facebook doesn't, I mean, that doesn't really buy us a lot. And yeah. we don't do a lot on X. 
mostly yeah. because it's just the people that are hire, hiring us aren't going to be on X. Yeah. 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 You know? I tried to get off it. I, I put it in hibernation for a couple months and I found I was still checking it anyway just because I didn't want conversations about the show happening without me at least right. knowing about it. Yeah. So I kind of got back in. But yeah, it's just one of those necessary evils. But I would think even on LinkedIn, I mean, right? You don't, like today, you didn't really name drop a single company. So even on LinkedIn, do you have to be, or do you get their permission or how does that work? If they give it to us, yeah. yes. You know, but otherwise, you know, you you just uh, either signing up. Mostly on LinkedIn, we post things like speaking at conferences or yeah. events or, you yeah. know. That, or that new could, products or, and services, that sort of stuff. New yeah. products and services. Yeah, we don't spend a lot of time on there talking about, you know, customer why achieved a 150% ROI because they engage check yeah, six. It's just, you. that's not how we generate business. Okay. We don't have people reaching out on social media going, I heard about you guys. Tell me more. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Well, and, maybe uh, someone will reach out after hearing you on the fighter pilot yeah, podcast. I hope so. But, I uh, hope so. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll throw an application in if I can't figure out this airline thing. So. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, guys. Well, I can't let you go unless we talk about call signs. Keith Kimmel, we'll start with you. Combat with a K. <sighs> I just, it's just not a good story unless you know the guy. So back when I was in A6s, there was a, it's still at Whidbey Island, I assume the theater is still there. And on the side of the theater, they had a monthly bombing competition called the, called the Pickle Barrel Competition. Okay. Right. So you'd go out and it was your first run, your first two runs of the, of the month. And there was a different target each time. There's tactical targets at Boardman Range. Right. So you fly like the 1350 down there. You drop the bombs. They tell you whatever your scores were. And you fly the 1355 back. So that's ter- the terrible low, life. The, the low level. Low level number, yeah. Yeah. yeah huh? Sorry. The low level. Yeah. yeah. The, the magic ride up there that everybody likes. Right. So. I just joined VA-196, and I'm I'm coming back from the gym with a friend of mine. I'll say his name, Sam Gurdon. And we drive by the theater, and Sammy had just won the competition the month prior. Okay. Right? So he, like, leans across. He makes a big deal out of it. He points <laughs> up at it, and he goes, look, I've done a deployment. I've been in the fleet for a year and a half or whatever. I've won the pickle barrel competition. There's nothing left but combat in the A6 for me. I didn't know much at the time, but I knew that that was wrong. So I just kind of, yeah, okay, whatever. And I start kind of razzing him about it. And then that afternoon I go fly and I come back and Sammy has completely spun the story around to whereas I was the one saying that there was nothing left in the A6. As a, as a new combat, person. As yeah. a new person. Yeah. Right? So I, I tried to pretend like, yeah, that's great. I love it. That's awesome. Call me that. Of course. It, it stuck. So right. there you go. Well, so, but also you have the K of Keith, the K of Kimmel, yeah. the K of the combat because they just wanted to yeah, don't, probably don't, yeah. raise you about exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So. But I just now realized, so you were in a VA, then a VF, and then a VFA? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that might be a first on the Yeah, cl- clean living. So yeah. there you go. Just That's means cool. I'm old. Actually... Well, yeah. BG went, uh, Brian Garrison, if you know him. So yeah, he was, yeah, right. so he was VABF, and then I was his XO in 103, yeah. Yeah, outstanding. All right, and uh, Yarko Sauce, JJ, with both perioded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so so I've had four different names. But uh, so, again, my family's from Ukraine, right? right. My legal name is Yerema Sush, right? But when I was a kid, my parents, when I went to grade school, because this is in the late 60s when I started <laughs> school, and being a... You know, having a weird name was not common in America at that time, nor culturally, you know. So mm-hmm. so I went as Jerome John. I hated that. Hated Jerome John. Yeah, sauce. You know, I hated that name. It was not me. Everybody knew me, called me Yarko. In college, I legally changed my name back. To, Yarko's like short for, is short for Yadama. Yarko's like Jim for James, okay. you know, in Ukrainian. All right. right? All right. So I got to college before I started my Navy career, got my name legally changed, went through the Navy as... Yarko, my Air Force call sign was Yarko. So when people, when I run into people, I know when I knew them based on what name they use on me, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. But then as we got to the oil field and after the military, my wife's like, hey, you know, that's just too hard for people. You know, Yarko's a hard name. Military's used to call signs. So we, when we moved down south, I became JJ. And that's my check six call sign, okay. I like to say. But again, in the company, people who know me, they call me Yarko. That's the story there. And Yarko, I never did anything. They just couldn't think oh, of yeah. anything. They exactly. never. They, and when I was in the Navy, nobody could come up with anything better than that. Yeah. yeah that's that was, how I knew you. In fact, I thought until about a week ago, getting ready for this, that you were, maybe initials were JJ, last name Sauce, call sign Yarko. I, I was, that, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so. I know. I, 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 like I said, I just changed. I have All as right. many call signs as personalities. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, I only saw one today, so that, that gives me uh, some hope. 
Yeah. All right, guys. Well, this has been a lot of fun, but I'll, I'll give you one chance for alibis, which is another thing, right? Uh, in right, the debrief, yeah, yeah. you come back, first thing you say is, you know, because you don't want it to be an excuse uh, necessarily. But uh, what are some alibis of whether it's processes, briefing, debriefing, checklists, or even check six that I uh, didn't ask you about? And, uh, uh, Yarko, we'll start with you. Well, I don't know. We talked about a lot of different yeah, stuff. Yeah, it was fun. So yeah. it was fun. It was, it was great to catch up and, and just, you know, again, relate some of the stuff we're doing. And, you know, I, I certainly didn't want this to be a commercial for Check 6. No, I don't think you it know, was. Yeah. And, that's, and yeah. that's important. Yeah. You know, I am pr- obviously very proud of the organization and what we've done. But, you yeah. know, again, this is about what our experience in the past and, and, and how that relates to people who didn't have that same experience. And it's been it's been a great ride. So yeah. thank you, Joe. For sure. You're welcome. Yeah, no, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here. I thought you did a fantastic job. Oh, well, thank you very much. What did we say, best ever? <laughs> <laughs> it's the best interview I've conducted today. I won't say that, <laughs> but we can debrief it on the way to uh, lunch. Yeah, so, sounds uh, good. If you guys are up for it, uh, Absolutely. let's go do that. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I sure do every time. Now, in case we had some jargon there you didn't understand, go on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary as well as musings, which are just our blogs and some cool merchandise that you can check out as well. So we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long.